Hello everyone. It's so great to be back at No Time To Wait. Some of you might remember that I presented my research back in 2018 at No Time To Wait 3 in London. Now that I've finished my research, I think it's fitting for me to be back to share my findings at No Time To Wait 6. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where I live and work, Boon Wurrung Country in Nam, Australia. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I extend my respect to any First Nations people watching today. Let's begin. Simply put, archives are records that have enduring value. Archives are records which transcend from their immediate context to a wider context, which enables them to function as homes for our administrative, creative, social, political, and cultural memories. Visual effects or VFX is a specialist creative and technical field of media production, generally carried out by visual effects companies. It utilizes digital filming technologies, animations, and other forms of computer generated imagery or CGI in situations where visual elements such as a scene, character, or effect is required for a film or television project, yet cannot be achieved during live action shooting. Visual effects generally involves combining CGI together with live action shots, although visual effects companies can also work on completely CGI projects such as 3D animation films. The international visual effects industry was valued to be worth $3.9 billion in 2019. This GIF is what's called a visual effects breakdown of a shot from the 2015 film, The Martian. It shows background environment set extensions and color filters that were digitally created and combined with live action footage by artists at a visual effects company called MPC. Over recent decades, digital visual effects have evolved into a global industry and have become an integral component of modern media production practice and telecinematic discourse. Presently, there are no efficient, consistent approaches in place for archiving visual effects records, and there is deficient representation of digital visual effects in film and television libraries, archives, and museums, or LAMs for short. The creation of visual effects archives will ensure that trustworthy information about how, why, and who of various film and television projects is preserved and accessible. How do we make this happen? Well, my research aims to address this by documenting current practices and determining ways to improve them. And to do this, I partnered with the visual effects industry. I worked with six different companies from around the world and interviewed about 20 visual effects practitioners. I also undertook a placement at the Australian Centre for the Moving Image with a time-based media conservator to understand practices around conserving complex digital objects. And I consulted with the tertiary sector and practitioners in museums and libraries and archives to expand my thinking about how visual effects archives could be collected and used. So, what did I learn and discover? Well, before we get into that, I'd like to share a case study to give you a taste of what I'm trying to address in my research. Now, a lot of what I'm covering in this case study was um, outlined in a recent paper of mine, so I encourage you to look up that if you'd like some more information. So, I had the great fortune of doing my research out of a specialised visual effects academy at the University of Technology, Sydney, called the Animal Logic Academy. And while I was there, they had a whole cohort of master's students that were studying visual effects and animation techniques. And as part of their work, they were creating a 3D animated short film called The Bounty Hunter. Now, the great thing about the UTS Animal Logic Academy is that they use industry standard hardware and applications. So it was a great opportunity for me to investigate information systems and the types of assets that are generated during production. One of the shots of the bounty hunter is PL020 or planet shot number two, which features the bounty hunter's spaceship landing over a blue alien worm. 
While only 160 frames long, this small shot of the project provides a good case study as it illustrates different kinds of visual effects assets and multiple file types that were generated using different industry applications. A key application used at the Academy and many visual effects companies is Shotgun, a cloud-based review and production tracking application. An examination of the Bounty Hunter project in Shotgun revealed that SHOT PL020 has 10 key assets. Inspection of the worm asset in Shotgun revealed that the students at the Academy undertook multiple tasks ranging from concept art to animation, character lighting and surfacing. For each of these tasks, students generated a range of different file types using professional digital content creation applications, including Autodesk Maya, and here's an animation rig of the worm using Maya. Students working on the Bounty Hunter project also used Foundry's Katana lighting and surfacing tool and Adobe Photoshop. They also used Adobe Substance, which is a 3D painter tool to create the surfacing of the worm. This tiny shot in the animation project also features assets associated with the planet environment, the spaceship and a virtual camera, plus a whole heap of other digital records that were generated as part of the project, such as sequences and shots, which were composited, edited and output as high quality ProRes 422 MOV video files for review and feedback. Assets, tasks, shots and sequences were logged and tracked using Shotgun. Training guides and tips were shared via wiki pages. Day-to-day -day announcements and production information was disseminated via Slack. Pipeline and technology tools and code were maintained and updated using various platforms and online code repositories. And administration records were created and maintained in Google Drive and Content Manager EDRMS. So I hope you found this case study illuminating. Despite being a small project, students at the UTS Animal Logic Academy created an industry standard project using industry tools and hardware. So what else did I discover in my research? Well, in the next part of this paper, I'm going to share some of my research findings with you. So as I mentioned earlier, I partnered with six visual effects companies to learn about their records and archiving. On the whole, companies are undertaking their records management and archiving in similar ways to each other. IT and data management teams oversee the archiving of production assets, which are typically stringently controlled and tracked during production, while other types of records are generally managed in an ad hoc fashion by multiple departments. Let's take a closer look. So key records of visual effects are production pipeline and editorial outputs known as assets and shots, which are generated using a variety of software tools. But these types of records are not found in LAMS. They rely on bespoke and commercial software and they become obsolete very quickly. These records are what is typically archived in visual effects companies onto linear tape open magnetic tapes. A copy of some of these records is delivered to the client. Unfortunately, the tapes are not always migrated to newer formats, making the data harder to restore and read over time. Most of the contextual information about these records is not archived. Instead, it remains online in separate systems to the tapes. Each project contract is different. There are no consistent requirements from the studios about the formats and types of records that should be delivered with the final shots. And under copyright law, the ownership of the records tends to sit with the studio, not the visual effects artist and company that created the records. These are all the other types of records typically generated in visual effects companies. These records are not usually archived. They are generally managed by separate departments in visual effects companies without governing policies or procedures to ensure they're managed efficiently. As the worm shot case study revealed, the visual effects industry uses a lot of proprietary formats. Visual effects production is always evolving, meaning that pipelines are in a constant state of change and the software alters from project to project, making it difficult to open and read assets as time goes by. For example, when discussing a decade old project with a practitioner, it became clear that assets from the project were no longer usable. The geometry cache that we would have used back then is a proprietary caching format that we don't use anymore. The rigs, 
the character rigs that we used were done in soft image, which is end of life. Nobody uses it anymore. The UVs were done in a proprietary format, which we've changed subsequently. And the renderer that we use to render the characters has changed. Aside from our ability to actually load up the geometry in our old format and convert it to a new bit of geometry, they're effectively useless. Despite these challenges, the industry has also made efforts to develop more open and ubiquitous file formats for use during production. An early example is the open EXR format developed by Industrial Light and Magic or ILM, first released in 2003. Open EXR is an open source, high dynamic range floating point image file format for high quality image processing and storage. The format was designed to meet high color fidelity needs of the visual effects industry, namely for compositing, and uses data compression to reduce image file size. More recently in 2011, Sony Pictures Imageworks and ILM produced the Alembic format, which focused on the interchange of 3D model geometries. Using Alembic reduces disk storage requirements as it bakes in complex digital geometric construction data such as polygon meshes and particles into an extensible format that is supported by common visual effects tools. Also during 2016, Pixar Animation Studios undertook an open source release of their Universal Scene Description USD framework. Essentially USD is a common format using hierarchically organized static and time sample data. It can be used by various digital content creation applications to support the interchange and augmentation of 3D scenes composed of elemental assets such as 3D models or animations. As part of my research, I explored the inclusion of visual effects records in film and television LAMs. I examined 11 established LAMs with extensive experience in collecting film and or television material. I only found three to have first-hand visual effects records in their collections. Limited examples of digital visual effects records include showreels and shot sequences at the Eye and the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia. While UCLA has paper files of a prominent television visual effects producer, Dan Curry, who worked on multiple Star Trek series. There are much more examples of physical records about related practical special effects such as matte paintings, photos and production files. And many LAMs also have digital animation film collections. While I could not locate a formal collection policy for each organisation, none of the policies that I examined mentioned visual effects. However, quite a few LAMs are looking to collect computer games and immersive media. The Academy Museum and the upcoming Lucas Museum of Narrative Art, both in Los Angeles, are planning to exhibit visual effects. However, it's unclear if they will acquire visual effects records for their collections. I also interviewed the Visual Effects Society or VES Archives Committee Chair to learn about their collection. While he wasn't a qualified archivist, he did work in the visual effects industry and has extensive knowledge about early computer graphics and visual effects production in the United States. He indicated that the VES does not have a formalized process in place for acquiring and sharing their collection. They have limited resources. Much of the work is achieved through word of mouth or people contacting the VES directly for help with research or to make donations. Their collection is mainly physical records and tapes housed in their office and a storage facility. And they don't have a digital repository to manage digital visual effects records or a catalog. I should note that after I did the interview, the VES Archives Committee changed membership and I tried to get a hold of the new chair, but they did not respond to my emails. So during my interviews with visual effects practitioners, I asked them about which records should be kept as archives. Interestingly, they did not suggest the asset records, which is what is currently archived in visual effects companies. Quite a few of them struggled to identify records that may have long-term value as this is something they had not ever considered before. For those that were able to provide suggestions, I've curated their responses and example records into the following themes. Creative process, such as breakdowns, art department records, and wiki records. Crew and labor, such as crew lists, summary and summary timesheets, internal and external communications, such as key emails, 
milestone projects, so records about award-winning projects and major new techniques, and technology development such as software and source code. As the first scholarly investigation of visual effects records and archiving, this research has taken important first steps to document, describe and assess archiving practices in the film and television visual effects industry. But there's much more work to be done. So I'd like to spend this last section of the paper reflecting on the importance of visual effects archiving and also highlighting the main challenges and some of my recommendations for improvement. The research, including opportunities to present at conferences like No Time To Wait, has introduced the field of visual effects to the cultural heritage sector and raises questions about the representation of digital production practices in film and television lands. If institutions are vying to collect immersive media and computer games, why not digital visual effects records? Currently, visual effects is an invisible job. If visual effects archiving was to be embraced, the scale and globalization of visual effects labor would become more visible. Uncredited artists could gain some acknowledgement of their work and the many visual effects companies that were forced to underbid for work and then close down would not be forgotten. We could visit an audiovisual archive or a museum to engage with our favorite superhero and learn that it took globalized systems of people, code and machinery working in concert to bring the characters to life on screen. As many visual effects records are generated through the production of film and television projects, it's highly plausible that film and media scholarship and practice could benefit from visual effects archives. Visual effects archives have the capacity to support investigations into the globalization of media labor, gender inequality in film and television, feminist studies about digital voyeurism, female character design and performance and much more. However, to ensure that visual effects records are identified for archiving and are managed and preserved accordingly, current practices will need to improve. So here are the key challenges I found through my research. Visual effects culture and operations lack a general awareness of records management and archiving. In my research, I didn't come across a single record specialist or archivist working at a visual effects company. Backing up to LTO tape is understood to be archiving. All of the focus is on asset records, despite their short-term value. Companies seem to be retaining assets for contractual reasons, not because they have ongoing value to the business. Now, this is probably the biggest challenge, copyright. Studios are the IP owners of visual effects records. To date, they have not donated visual effects records to film and television lands. They treat the records as IP, not cultural artifacts. This is despite the fact that studios have a long-standing history of donating their analog records and artifacts to publicly accessible institutions, such as the Academy Film Archive, the UCLA Film and Television Archive, and USC's Moving Image Archive. Finally, key national film and television lands, including the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia, do not appear to be asking for visual effects records. This is despite the fact that many governments are offering visual effects companies handsome subsidies and that many collection policies are being expanded to include games and extended reality, record types that are extremely similar to visual effects. So a key outcome of my research was the development of these recommendations for the industry. Now, these approaches may seem obvious to archivists, but maybe not so much to visual effects practitioners. So more information about these recommendations and the overall research can be found in my thesis, which is now available in the UTS Opus repository. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about my research and its outcomes. Now, hopefully I'll be joining in to answer some of your questions. It's lovely to have you here. Thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's a massive topic of research, I think, and you seem to have been incredibly thorough in your research and in your presentation of it. I wondered if maybe you felt there were any gaps at all in there. I can't imagine there are, but would you say there were any? Yeah, um, I'd say one of the biggest gaps was that um, I, I had struggled to get um, studios on board with my research. Um, I was only able to work with one 
um, archive group within the studio um, and it would have been really great to have had more. Um, and that was an issue that my examiners picked up when they were reading my thesis and they were like, oh, is it a, we're not sure whether this is it's good enough just to have one. And I said, well, look, one's better than nothing, so I'm, I'm keeping it in. Um, but, yeah, that would have been a, a, a great opportunity to have collaborated with some more studios. So the studio that I worked with was more of... Um, Everything's de-identified, but they generate more episodic content and visual effects heavy content, which was great. And the archivists had a really sort of good handle on what was what was going to be coming to them. But it would have been good to also have engaged with like a bigger kind of film studio, but maybe in the future. It seems like this is a wonderful approach for the archiving industry to get some insight, I think, into industries. If you had um, more funding, where would you where would you go next with your research? Um, it's probably two things that I would have, like, I'd love to be able to do. Um, one would be to partner with uh, with an art, like an audiovisual archive, maybe like the BFI or something, and do some work with some the curators and archivists, and, and partner with uh, potentially a visual effects company, or um, and maybe trial doing um, some some transfer work and documentation work, and sort of see what what could happen out of that process. Um, and then the other thing that kept coming up a lot, especially when I was talking to um, dev teams in visual effects companies, was the potential of maybe creating a, a piece of software, like an archiving module that could be connected to something like Shotgun, so that maybe there's a way that they could flag sort of assets and records that are, have been locked in, logged into Shotgun that maybe has long-term value for the business and for sort of uh, other kind of you know, sort of historical, hello, <laughs> sorry for you, other kind of historical purposes. So, yeah, as because I have to say, like, seeing these presentations, I'm always super impressed by, you know, what can be achieved through, um, you know, technical expertise and, and coding and everything. And that's, that's I'm a traditional archivist in my training. And so, yeah, I'm, I, I like those, I like that ability to just be able to, create software and stuff, that's not my skill set. But I'd love to be able to work with someone to do that maybe one day. We have, I think maybe we can just squeeze in one quick question from the um, the online viewers. Uh, Connor Lynott was okay. asking how helpful can film directors be in helping to preserve the FX? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess it would depend on, on the director and their influence. So um, directors, like big scale directors that have good relationships with visual effects um, practitioners, like, uh, you know, like, I guess, examples like Avatar and things, those kind of big scale projects, like, there'd be probably a bit more of an understanding. Like, John Favreau has a really good relationship with um, visual effects companies having sort of really delved into the, into the field, having not previously done it until he sort of got into the Marvel universe. So there are, I'd say that's a good approach if, because then if the directors are kind of pushing it, then the studio may get on board because they have a bit of power. So I like that idea. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Eva. We really appreciate you coming late. Thank you.